So in order to, you know, keep us, keep us on schedule, um, I can just, um, I'll start off again. I pretty much explained the, the, the sort of basic idea of our Ag Allies program and the fact that we've been working with awesome land trust folks like Irene and John Luke. And um, we have, we st our program started back in 2016. We have been growing steadily over the years and you can see that um, we are up to over a thousand acres that we've enrolled in a delayed mowing or delayed grazing program. Um, and those are all inhabited grassland bird inhabited acres, and um, we've been increasing the number of landowners and land trusts that we have been working with every year, which has been great. And I would like to call your attention to um, the contact information and our website. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out. And with that, I will pass it along to Irene to talk about GRLT. Great, thank you, Laura. So at Georges River Land Trust, we're located up in mid-coast Maine, and we have uh, just shy of uh, 5,000 acres conserved. And of that, 17 of the properties we have conserved are farms. Um, so I'll get to that in a second. Just a little bit about the RCP that we're part of. It's the 12 Rivers Conservation Initiative, which is a group of different land trusts, um, covering 825,000 acres. Um, and we work together on a myriad of projects, including um, collaborations on climate resiliency, climate communication, and hemlock woolly adelgid uh, management. And so through our RCP, we heard about the, R the Ag Allies program and knowing that a bunch of the farms we have conservation easements on had grasslands, it seemed like a great opportunity for us. And so we engaged in the project um, with sort of three desired outcomes, um, education, protecting and demonstrating best practices on one of our preserves and engaging with easement landowners. Um, so the preserve that we did educational outreach on and enhanced is around 90 acres of grassland fields um, where we took soil samples. A local farmer um, enhanced the soils with fertilizer that was um, the Soil and Water Conservation District partners at Ag Allies helped us um, acquire and pay for and that was all done by a local farmer. And then our easement landowners, this was a really special project for us because it was a new way to engage with easement landowners. And um, of the farms identified, nine of them initially seemed to be a good fit. Um, so Laura and I went out in the fall and um, that, nine farms went down to six that looked ideal and we went back in the spring with the landowners and identified which grassland birds were present and what could be done to enhance those properties. Laura took some soil samples at some farms, worked with um, some active farmers to change mowing practices and of the six that were deemed a good fit, all of them signed on to be part of the conservation mowing program. So that was amazing. And um, together with our 90 acre preserve, about 256 acres in our region alone are now under the conservation mowing practices. So that's a little bit about uh, the 12 Rivers RCP and what we did. And Ali will hand it off to Jean-Luc now. All right. Um, so we're still in the beginning stages of our restoration project. Um, we have seeded and limed a portion of a field. So we're in central Maine, um, right outside of Augusta. Um, project is in Fayette. Um, this is the Surrey Hill Conservation Area. Um, and 
we're hoping <laughs> we, we now have funding through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, to hopefully get up to 20 to maybe 25 acres um, if everything goes well, um, to have a nice grassland habitat that we can show um, our members of the land trust and other community members in, in our service area. Okay. Awesome. So I think now we can open it up if anyone has any questions. Jillian, you can go ahead and ask your question. Um. I just, you mentioned soil samples, and I was just wondering what you were doing the soil sampling for. Laura, do you want to take that? I would be happy to. Um, with some of our fields, if they have gotten, and oftentimes this is true for land trust fields that maybe have been mowed on the later side for um, because they didn't want to mow any grassland bird habitat before the birds were fledged. They're starting to see woody invasives starting to encroach and that sort of thing. And so the soil tests we provide when we have landowners or other um, land managers who are interested in refurbishing their fields, like um, what John Luke was talking about. In fact, with his, we started with soil tests to see what nutrients were required and that sort of thing, because we wanted to bring the field back into um, good quality grassland habitat and production. And generally speaking, the what's good quality for forage production for a lot of farmers is also um, gonna help the birds because they like that nice, dense, um, non-weedy um, grass growth and grasses and forbs. So anyway, the soil test is a great place to start if we have a field that we're looking to bring back into um, as good a quality grassland habitat as we can provide. Pam, you have your hand raised. I do. Um, so what's the time frame for when you guys, in any of these cases, you know, start the incentive thing in terms of how long does the farmer get incentives relative to, you know, bigger picture things like sustaining grassland bird populations on that landscape? That's a good question. And um, the answer is kind of, it depends. Again, we've been, uh, a, we've been a program since 2016. And since then, I'm, we're finding that for a lot of folks, um, providing the incentive payments for two to three years is a great start to kind of help them get over the the management changes and having to add one more thing to, as you all can imagine, farmers are have a, a huge list of things, concerns and challenges that they have. So the incentive payment, while not huge, is intended to kind of offset that risk and offset the hassle of those management changes. And we are finding that if we provide that for a couple or three years, oftentimes many many of the landowners are then willing and able to, they've kind of made that part of their um, farm management program and they'll continue forward with it without needing the additional incentive payments. It depends. We have a couple, especially our dairy farmers, because they're really needing to get high quality, uh, high protein hay. It's really a bigger ask for them. So sometimes we might carry them longer. Um, but generally we're finding we're getting a pretty good rate of adoptability after, and some folks don't even need an incentive payment at all. They just, you know, will come in and say, look, we're, we're willing to do this, but we don't have the technical expertise in order to know where the birds are and what we should, you know, what the time frame is that we need to um, give them their space. So it kind of runs the gamut there. I will just add from the land trust side, a lot of our landowners, it was just um, the lack of education. They just didn't know that the yeah. birds were even there. Um, and that just instantly changed it for them. They didn't need an incentive um, to to be part of the delayed mowing practice. Um, and some of our conservation easements now have 
uh, language of, around delayed mowing written into it. And then Mark, um, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I was just kind of curious, um, <clears throat> the, the ratio of, of actual farmers who are farming versus um, those folks that um, just happen to have a hay field, which they want to keep open. And so it's easy economically for them to do that. In terms of those, the folks that we have in our program, I'm assuming you're, yeah. you're yeah. asking. And I, you know, you're saying that I'm thinking, oh, I should have done the, the numbers on that. But the, the big takeaway here is that, you know, we, our incentive payments are pretty much reserved for the first category, for the actual farmers who it's a big deal for them to change their management around. If we have folks who come and say, you know, we just want to keep our field open and, you know, it's no big deal to us, but, you know, maybe they just bush hog it or they, you know, I don't know, hay it, but they don't really do much of anything other than mulch hay with it. Those are not the folks that are getting incentive payments. They We would provide them technical assistance, but the incentive payments are going 100% to farmers who are making a living and actually harvesting those that grass for forage for either for their animals or for other animals. So. And then one more question. Sure. Um, do you have, so in the Champlain Valley of Vermont, yes. we have this lovely plant called poison parsnip. Uh -huh. Yes. And so what happens to our fields where we just delay mowing, mm -hmm. they often turn yellow within two or three years. Uh, and so our challenge is, um, you know, delayed mowing isn't always the option. Um, and, and sometimes farmers can select an early cut and then a later cut, Yep. miss that yep. second cut. And we, we're part of the bobbling project, which, you know, hopefully helps support that. I'm just wondering, have has Maine encountered poison parsnip and is it how present it is on the landscape? Yeah, that uh, you hit on one of our biggest challenges, not specifically poison parsnip, because not wood, we don't have a ton of that in most of our fields that we're working with. But we do have, you know, we have spotted knapweed and we have uh, smooth bed straw. And so we have invasives that um, on some of our fields are ready to and willing to, you know, take over the whole field. So um, if we have those kinds of invasive pressures, that calls for a site-by-site -site, um, sort of plan in terms of how to balance as much nesting habitat as we can carve out and how to both and also manage some of these invasives so that they don't take over the fields. So, you know, we're fortunate in some of our fields, they're beautiful, you know, they don't have the, they don't have those pressures, but we are noting that, it, you know, I can't, there's no one size fits all for those kinds of situations. It is a challenge. And we end up doing, you know, for some of those fields, you know, we're doing some field rehab that is that has to kind of be in stages and we're trying to leave, you know, parts for the, for nesting while, you know, rehabbing at the same time. So things can get tricky and challenging with those particular types of fields. Jillian, would you like to ask your question? Sure, I just wonder what are the incentives? Do you just do a flat rate per acre? And how we much do not, it? that's a good question. We don't do a flat rate per acre. It's based on the amount of acreage offered. All of the acreage offered has to have the confirmed nesting habitat and then, and we take into account how inhabited those acres are by grassland birds. So we would give priority to fields that are that are really um, particularly good nesting sites. So um, there there is no, you know, kind of like uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service has practices where it's X amount per acre. We, we are, um, it's more of a process of going out and checking and then um, calculating what the incentive payment would be. Is there a range? Or can yes, you just it's a, a pretty, it's a pretty broad range. And again, part of it also has to do with, you know, some farmers will say, you know, 
all I all I'm looking for in an incentive payment is I really need to line my field, you know, within the next five years. So if I could get enough, you know, incentive payment to take care of that, then I'd be happy. So, but I would say generally there the per acre uh, range is somewhere between it goes from probably thirty five dollars an acre up to probably eighty dollars an acre. Okay, thanks. Yes, Ashley, you've had your hand raised. You're Can't on hear you. you. Sorry. No, my microphone was just too high. Um, yeah. I have a few questions, um, if that's all right. Uh, going off of the uh, Jillian's questions for the cost per acre, is that including costs for the technical guidance or is that just for um, the actual management on the ground? The, those That payment goes to uh, specifically to the farmers for their agreement to leave the habitat standing Throughout the nesting season, we don't charge for technical assistance. Anybody who um, signs on to be part of the program or asks for technical assistance um, at the beginning of the season. Uh, basically, I should explain that our program pretty much starts in May when, when the grassland birds are coming back. So I already have a list of, gosh, I think it's 50 new farmers this year as well as um, some of our, you know, previous per, uh, participants. So starting at the beginning of May, I'll be making, you know, our, my, our team will be uh, scheduling appointments for site visits and basically checking in on the habitat and checking in with the farmers. And at, so each year, it's a, it's a one-year agreement. So if somebody's, um, says I'm interested in being part of the program. At that initial site visit, we're finding out, are they gonna need an incentive payment? Are they going to need, um, you know, we can offer a static date in terms of, you know, if you wait till July 15th or 20th, um, then you should be good, fine to mow because that's a, generally a fairly safe date. For some of our farmers who are really, you know, this is tough for them, it's often our dairy farmers, we offer um, site visits as it gets towards the towards the time when the birds will be flying, and we will be checking for flighted birds um, from you know a certain point onwards. So we can what we call clear the fields as soon as the birds are flighting flighted. The farmers can get in and mow. So again, mm -hmm. that's another way that we're trying to combat having a lot of invasives come in. We want them to be able to get in there as soon as they can. Okay. And how um, are program staff funded? We ha now have an official partnership with Cornell. So we have gotten some grant funding through them for the past few years. Um, we have also partnered with our main inland fish and wildlife um, department here. And um, they're providing, um, once we have proven that um, what we're doing, they, they've they signed on and they're um, providing um, some both technical assistance as well as financial assistance. Okay. I think that's all the time we have. We... 